So, I worked for a company called Ground Feeders. Basically, what we do is when a client buys a property, we dig up the ground and get it all ready for them to inspect and plan out their development or whatever the hell they want to do with it. A lot of the time, we're chopping down trees, plowing debris, all that fun stuff. This property in particular, we had to create a stable foundation for them to start construction on building an entire new facility. My duty is to lead the excavation team and ensure we are navigating underground properly. The area we are working in is very unstable, and we had to dig a significant amount of land before even starting on our main line of work. This is a very important task, since our team could be underground and suddenly they compromised the structure of the foundation and things cave in on them. After every excavation shift, I throw on my hard hat and headlamp and have to go map out the area we just completed moments prior. What I've found has scarred me for life. I have never witnessed anything as horrifying and traumatic as what I'm about to tell you. That day, we had a late shift because we were significantly behind schedule. If the labourers are staying late, I'm there even later. And since I'm a supervisor, I'm usually there before anyone arrives as well. After the long shift, I go through my routine of mapping out the pre-dug area. Things were going as normal when I spotted something odd sticking out of the ground right at the edge of where our team left off. At a glance, it looked as if one of the workers left a tool, so I decided to pick it up and return it to them since I'm such a good guy and all. This is where things suddenly took a turn for the worst. It turns out that it wasn't a tool at all, but a round U-shaped handle sticking right out of the soil and rock. My heart raced and I quickly dug at the ground with my hands, scratching away just enough to see that this is a bunker door. For a moment, I was frozen. There wasn't civilization damn near 20 miles in each direction. This intrigues me even more. There was a giant turnstile lock that sealed the door. I pried at it for about 15 minutes until it finally gave way letting out a deep sigh of relief while wiping the sweat from my forehead, I pulled the handle and the door opened. Almost instantly, I was mauled by the horrific odour. It was so putrid I damn near threw up instantly. Retreating to the entrance of the job site, I grabbed one of our respirator masks, a pair of thick work gloves and a heavy duty LED flashlight. I returned to the mysterious door and mentally prepared myself before venturing further. Finally, I pulled the latch back open and flinched as if I was expecting the foul odour to accept my nostrils and brace once again. Luckily, the respirator worked its magic and I took another step forward. Shining my light downward, I could see the steel grated steps that led to another sealed blast door. There was a latch and slide lock that I was capable of opening once I put on the handy gloves I brought along. Behind the door was a long corridor. Hanging on the walls were what seemed like maps of the facility. This place was huge. The first thing that came to mind was that maybe I'd get a huge payout for finding some sort of terrorist hideaway. I looked a little closer and what it seemed was there were two floors further underground below mine. Ripping the map off the wall, I proceeded down the hallway and there was a split. My two options were either to go through the next blast door in front of me or hang a left down the hall to what seemed, according to the map, was a path to the stairs leading to the next floor below. What the map said was that the room in front of me was just a 16 by 12 basic office type room. My curiosity got the best of me, and I decided to enter the next room. After passing through the door, 
I scanned the area to see there was a desk, three office chairs, and loads of monitors with all kinds of out-of-date equipment hooked up to them. The thing caught my eye first was the obvious stack of VCRs to the far left of the desk. Alongside it were monitors stacked two high and three across. In front of each set of monitors were a microphone, set of controls, and a thick composition notebook. All three of the chairs had their own set of monitors and equipment in front of them, followed by their own notebooks and microphone. My guess was that this was some sort of scientific research facility. I looked at my watch and realized that it was getting late and I needed to get back home. Before leaving, I walked up to the VCR and forced out the first couple of tapes. I wanted some homework. That night, I could not rest. Fortunately for me, it was Friday. After tossing and turning in my bed, I decided I needed some sort of closure. I jumped into my slippers, waltzed downstairs into the garage, and dug out an old VCR and television I just couldn't seem to get rid of. Now, I regret ever keeping the damn thing. There I was, sitting on the floor of my office, in my jammies, setting up a nearly antique video player. I wiped the old decrepit dust off the first tape and popped it in. It started as a profile shot of a man in a lab coat. He had a dark complexion, dark eyes and jet black hair. The remainder of his face was covered by a black mask from the nose down. Hello viewers! As you've all anticipated, our series premiere begins today. He announced this with loads of enthusiasm, but something about his demeanor was troubling. We have four willing contestants. Your contributions have made this possible. These young men and women will be locked away in our underground facility with no means of entertainment. The only functions of this location are a fully functional kitchen, plumbing, and your basic electrical needs. He paused for a moment and looked past the camera. This isn't your typical reality show. There will be no elimination challenges. The only objective is to provide these contestants pre-cooked human remains. Their behavior over the next eight weeks will be observed and documented by our team of specialists. His voice grew louder with enthusiasm. Our subjects are fully aware of the conditions. They are to interact with one another. We will withdraw ourselves from any form of contact, aside from a few surprises. At the end of the show, the remaining contestants will be rewarded with a rather generous cash prize. The tape cut out for a moment and continued with interviews of each of the four participants. It was a sort of grab bag type of bunch. Two men, two women. One of the women appeared to be a little strung out. The other three seemed normal. Nothing out of the ordinary. After the character interviews, the tape changed over to a surveillance shot of the living room and all four of the participants lounging around on the furniture. Shortly after, there was a loud buzzing and the group are prompted to head to the dining area. This was their first meal, it seemed. The food provided seemed disguised as any typical dinner. One large serving of meat fillet, alongside a very small portion of vegetables and one piece of bread. There were tags attached to each plate. One of the men read theirs out loud. Male, 28, in a thigh, died of lung disease. He read aloud with a tone of absolute disgust in his voice. The other members chatted nervously. The two males gladly ate the small, unsatisfactory additions, but neglected the meat. The two women didn't even touch their plates at all. I don't know if I could do this, exclaimed the young blonde-haired woman. She had long, manicured nails and heavy caked on makeup. It's one thing when they disguise it as animals, but I can't eat it knowing who it was and how they died. It's just psycho. Her voice was loud and obnoxious. 
the woman quickly rose from her seat and made her way back to the living area. This didn't do much for her since there was no means of entertainment anywhere to be seen. She sat there with a disgusted and fearful look in her eyes. The camera switched back to the dining area where the two men were poking and prodding at their food. Whatever, I guess I'll give it a shot. Protein's protein. The muscular man, who appeared to be in his late twenties, cut a bite-sized piece from the slab and ate it disdainfully. Holy crap, this is incredible. There's no way this is human meat. I think they're playing mind games. Idiots. Easiest hundred grand I'll ever make. He exclaimed with another mouthful of human flesh squeezing between his teeth. The man proceeded to devour his meal, while the other two sat there and watched with their jaws hanging wide open. He finished his plate and dropped it in the sink, then left through the passageway back into the living area. The second man, an older gentleman with a slightly heavier physique, slowly finished his sides and tossed the prepared meat into the trash. He then looked behind him at the remaining woman at the table, who had began to sob and placed a hand on her shoulder as he passed her to join his roommates. The remaining girl proceeded to bawl her eyes out. She pulled and twisted at her dark brown hair. This started to disturb me. At first, I thought maybe this is all a staged performance, but there's no way the acting was this good. I shook off the idea and kept my eyes glued to the television screen. This had to be fake. The three participants sat together for the remainder of the night, two of which scolded the muscular man for relentlessly devouring his meal, while he just smirked and rolled his eyes continuously. I'm telling you guys, it's all a facade. They're trying to get a reaction out of us. That's the point of the show. American television at its finest. And not only will I be leaving here a hundred grand richer, I'll be a star. The man stood and made a very amorous pose while looking directly at the camera mounted to the ceiling in the corner of the room. I felt as if he was looking directly at me. The night went on. I assumed they would have pulled a lot of this filler out in the editing process since it was incredibly boring. I fast forwarded the tape until it changed to a scene of the muscular man in his bed. The camera was in its night vision mode and it sat steadily in the corner of his bedroom. He tossed and turned violently in his sleep. My assumption was that the food wasn't prepared well enough and it was making his stomach uneasy. Soon enough, he rose from the bed. His eyes glowed in the reflection of the camera's night lens. It looked menacing. He then made his way to the kitchen, and the cameras followed him from room to room, switching from one to the other. He seemed as if he was in a sleep consciousness. His demeanor was rather... different, since he usually walks with an arrogant stride. This stance was different, sluggish. He stepped lightly, as if hypnotized by some sort of force. The man halted at the trash can and leaned over, bending at the waist. You could hear through the microphone a malicious growl. He reached both hands into the trash and violently dug through the discarded food until he stopped. Motionless. He froze in that position for a few seconds. Then, you could see his shoulders rustling. When he pulled his torso from inside of the garbage can, you could see he was eating something. It was the other roommate's discarded meat. You could hear the moans of pleasure between the sounds of meat grinding against his teeth and slapping his tongue while he gnawed at it like a rabid beast. The tape clacked and snipped. My screen went black, and the VCR ejected the tape at me with a mechanical whir. I was thoughtless. My mind had just ceased to work as I sat there in complete surprise to what I had just witnessed. I'm slowly gripping the idea that this 
may not be a fictional broadcast. But I hoped, to whatever god there may be, that I was wrong. Please let me be wrong. After pulling the tape from the VCR, I noticed a subtle inscription on the outside of the VHS. I took a picture of it in case anyone could recognize it. It is heavily suggested that if you come across this logo on anything, that you stay away. There is something sinister about this organization, true or not. I climbed to my feet and staggered my way to the restroom. Peering into the mirror, you could easily identify the signs of fatigue. My eyes had dark circles around them, while above, my eyelids sat low. Although I desperately needed to recharge my batteries, I wouldn't have slept well until I finished these series of recordings. I hobbled to the kitchen and poured myself a cup of cold stale coffee and returned to my station. After sliding the next tape into the VCR, I tapped the rewind button to ensure I didn't miss any important details. I could hear the gears twirling around in a counterclockwise motion, followed by a click and the whirring and buzzing as it auto-engaged its playback function. The scene started with a shot of the dining room table, with four meals set up accordingly. The loud buzzing indicated again that it was mealtime. The camera angle swiped between each of the individual's bedrooms and gave simultaneous shots of each person waking up and running through their morning routine. I hit the fast forward button and let go once they arrived at the dinner table. Immediately, the muscular man started to devour his breakfast. The others sat there in disgust and stared as their face twisted into more and more anguish. The more feminine of the two women grabbed the tag and read out loud. Female, nine, brain matter, died from an automotive collision. Her face stayed locked in a horrified expression. The other female gagged and lunged towards the trash as her body evacuated what I'm assuming was bile due to the fact that she had missed her previous meal. After recovering from her regurgitation, she kneeled and peered into the trash can. Her eyes grew wide, as if she'd seen a ghost. The remainder of the guests sat at their dinner table. Mr. Muscles promptly finished his meal and let out a large belch as he leaned against the back of his chair. I give up. If sexy over here can eat this, I sure as hell can. There's no way I'm going another minute without food. The blonde woman exclaimed as she picked up a fork and slowly nibbled at the piece of brain tissue. To hell with it, the older gentleman added, whilst following through on taking his first bite as well. To my surprise, they both indulged in their morning meals as if it were the best thing to ever touch their tongue. They scraped at their plates with the forks to collect every possible bite they could. The muscular man stayed seated and watched with satisfaction as his comrades joined him in this disgusting endeavour. As all of that took place, the other woman ignored the meal and climbed to her feet as she walked off slowly back to her bedroom. The camera switched locations following her. She laid in her bed for the rest of the evening. One woman and two men were all gathered in the living room. They were chatting about how delectable their breakfast was. This food is to die for. I feel so alive after eating, like a breath of fresh air, gawked the woman as she gestured every word with her arms like a crude version of sign language. I never expected this at all. After breakfast, I felt as if I'm capable of anything. What do you think they're planning for lunch? replied the older man. This went on for the next few hours. Within that time, the muscular young man slipped away from the two. Just as he left the room, the camera follows him to the hallway. He sits there with his ear to the girl's door. I fast forward the tape. 
it jumps back and forth from a heated conversation between the two who remained in the living room and the hallway where the young man continued stalking the sad girl. There was this look in his eyes. It was a look of animosity. Of all the things witnessed in this video, I think the behaviour of the young man is what shook me the most. He was generally normal in the first day or two. Then, after indulging more, something about him just seemed to change. The tape ended after showing the contestants going to bed. I rubbed my eyes to remove the mucus that developed in the corners of them. Now that I look back on it, I really don't think I blinked in the entire time. After letting out a long, weary yawn, I refilled my coffee and proceeded onto the third tape. Tape 3 started just the same as the last one, only the three who ate their dinner came to the table. The sad girl stayed in bed and continued with her routine. I started to respect her strong will, but then again, I was confused upon the fact that she did willingly sign up for this. The group immediately dove into their plates face first, all three of them completely neglected their silverware. They snarled and growled at each other, as if they were rabid beasts fighting over a fresh kill. This terrified me as this transformation happened overnight. When the no longer primped and groomed woman finished the plate, she lunged on top of the older gentleman and started ripping at him with her bare hands. There were lacerations and tears all over the man's neck, and he just screamed and growled in the struggle to throw her off of him. He managed to launch her off, and she flew across the room like a rag doll. By this time, the muscular man, who looked more beast-like than the others, had already finished his and the other man's plate while he was distracted. The older man, now furious that his meal was devoured, began to snarl and show his teeth to his new enemy. The young, muscular man stood up tall and buffed his chest outwards. Almost immediately, the older man began to stand down as the alpha made his stature clear. After a brief standoff, the muscular man began to stare directly into the camera in the kitchen. Slowly, he walked towards its lens and got his face as close as humanly possible. I need more. His voice was rough and distorted almost as if he was possessed. He continued to stare into the camera for several minutes, gritting his teeth like a rabid wolf. I could see the drool bellowing in the corners of his mouth as it pulled down the sides of his chin. After only a few minutes, a vent in the ceiling slid open. Like rainfall, countless severed limbs and organs fell from the passage and filled the floor of the kitchen. You could hear flesh smacking hard against the linoleum. Entrails were caught in the serrations of the exterior of the vent and hung from the ceiling like a cruel decoration. The three howled and dove into the buffet of human remains, like throwing a raw steak into a cage full of hungry lions. They devoured each piece mercilessly, as if it were the only meal they'd ever have again. Once satisfied, and the feeding ended, they lay there on their backs, with this twisted grin of satisfaction. I quivered at the sight of this. My hands were shaking while I held my coffee mug in place. The tremors caused my beverage to splatter all over my shirt and sprinkle down onto the floor. My eyes hurt, and I didn't even notice the light peering in through my closed curtains. I couldn't look away. I had to see the conclusion to this horrific broadcast. The tape cut out amid them savouring their previous meal. After about 30 seconds of pure darkness, the image came to view in a four-way split screen. Each screen was of one participant sleeping in their beds. Almost as if they had an alarm set, Three of the four rose slowly from under their covers. The glow in their eyes was sinister, 
and the look on their faces seemed truly primal. Individually, each one of them made their way through the thresholds of their rooms and made it out into the hallway. Coming together like as if it were all premeditated, they made their way to the young girl's room. She hadn't moved from her bed since the previous night. I can imagine she didn't have the energy after going days without any food. After hearing the horrific sounds that echoed throughout the house, I wouldn't want to investigate or witness what was happening if I was in her shoes. They congregated outside a door as the alpha male pushed his way to the front. Slowly, he turned the knob and you could see the dim beam of light spear its way through the crack of the door. All I could hear was the sound of heavy, animalistic breathing and what sounded like the gargling of saliva through my speakers. In the blink of an eye, all three of them pounced on the girl in a bed, ripping the sheets off to expose her weak, helpless body to the blood-hungry beasts. Their teeth sank into her flesh as each one of them tugged on a different limb, slowly ripping her into thirds. The sound of her violent screams nearly shattered my eardrums as she squirmed and convulsed in pain. The girls stood no chance as they ripped her to pieces and gnarled off every piece of flesh from her bone. The room was filled with blood, pooling on the floors as it leaked from the now ruined bed. They bathed in the blood of the poor girl, who was now in several pieces scattered throughout the room. Growls and inhuman snarls were exchanged as one would reach for a new limb after finishing another. If I hadn't been so numb from the lack of sleep, I'd have vomited or passed out from the sight of this. Something kept my eyes glued to the screen as I watched these beastly cannibals devour their once fellow contestant. I suppose this was their process of elimination. The tape cut after they finished with their feast. It opened with the two male participants going at it violently like wild animals. The two men were relentlessly biting and tearing at each other's flesh. Blood spewed across the living room in all directions. You could hear the anger and pure evil in their voices between the sounds of tearing skin. There wasn't anything human left in them. The woman was nowhere to be found, and from the looks of the room, it seems as if it must have been days since the last scene. There were countless organs strung around the entire house as the camera changed views to show its delightful scenery. My only assumption was that her corpse lied somewhere in this mess. The battle continued for what seemed like an hour. There was no stop to it until one of them was dead. The muscular man stepped back and swung his arm wildly, grabbing the other by what remained of his hair. In the same motion, he pinned his head to the ground and completely severed it from his body. In his victorious stance, he raised his opponent's head above his body and tilted his own head back with his mouth wide open. The blood that lingered in the severed head was being dripped downward into the man's mouth as he gulled it down until it came to a halt. He took a large bite out of the cheek of the man's face, then tossed his head across the room. Suddenly, he turned to the camera and approached it, still chewing the mouthful of flesh he just bit off. I win, he said, while staring directly into the lens of the camera. The screen was locked on his face for about 30 seconds before the tape ended. With a quiet click, the screen went black, and the sound of the tape auto-ejecting brought me back into reality. In complete awe, I froze. What in the absolute hell did I just watch? I scrambled for my phone with the intent of calling the police when I realized it was already Monday morning. Was it really that long? There was no way these tapes held that much footage. I rushed to get my clothes back on, 
threw the tapes into a plastic bag and bolted out of the door to make it back to the job site. My plan was to inform my superior and then turn these tapes over to the police. Whoever hosted this sick and twisted game needed to see justice. I pulled my truck onto the job site. Then I noticed the white Prius with the familiar logo on the side of it. Suddenly, I remembered the symbol from the header of our contract. It also matched the inscription on the outside of the VHS tapes. All I knew about the client was that they were an independently funded medical research team that was supposed to be coming up with some sort of breakthrough in modern medicine. My heart sank into my stomach as my skin instantly grew cold. I bolted from my truck with a bag of tapes in hand and burst through the door of the portable office building. My body damn near shut down when I saw the back profile of a man with jet black hair and a white lab coat sitting in the chair across from my boss's desk. You look like crap, my superior spat out as he looked me up and down. This is no way to present ourselves as a professional in front of our customer, he added. The man turned around to look at me. A smile grew upon his face when his eyes fixated on the transparent bag I held in my hand. Sir, I found these on site last week. It's important that you take a look at them, for everyone's sake. I managed to squeak the words out before being interrupted by my superior. You found these on site? This property is owned by a client, and any items found within its confines are in direct possession of the property owner, our client. He screamed so loud that it made my eardrums rattle. Thank you so much. I actually lost these when inspecting the land just a couple months ago. You see, these tapes are extremely important to our research, and I am forever grateful for you to return them for me. The scientist's smile grew into a wide, toothy grin as he snatched the bag from my weakened grip. The man then turned towards my boss and gave him a farewell nod as he walked to the door. Him and I locked eyes as he passed me by. The smile never left his face. From that moment on, I quit my job at Ground Feeders and quickly sold all my assets, moving far away from that place. I'm telling you this as a warning to get this off my chest. I've been living with this burden for five years now, and I still see pieces of flesh being ripped apart by those beasts every time I close my eyes. I don't know how long I can deal with the trauma of what I witnessed. For now, I'll just take it day by day.